So our next few minutes are a quick tutorial on the good, the bad, the possible and the impossible in extensive reading and extensive reading programs. And I will also share a platform where everybody can connect so that we can share information, uh, uh, people who are interested in extensive reading. Okay. Right, so let's begin with what is extensive reading? It is silent reading where students read for pleasure at their own speed. And they really pick up their own books. Uh, nobody decides it for them. It helps them increase their confidence because they are reading for pleasure and they are reading to increase their own fluency. In comparison to intensive reading, uh, Intensive reading is really focused on the language where everything is assessed. There are specific learning aims and tasks, and the aim is to get the students to learn new vocabulary through careful reading, comprehension checks, grammar exercises, and sometimes even translation exercises of passages, and the books are decided by the teacher. Uh, most of the time, every student in the same class reads exactly the same text. So, Day and Bamford identify some principles of success in setting up an extensive reading program. The material has to be easy, which means learners choose what they want to read according to their own levels and understanding. They read as much as possible in time that is allocated for the reading and the purpose is really for pleasure, which means reading becomes its own reward because the reading speed is faster. They do it silently. They don't look for individual words to understand. It's just the overall text. And the role of the teacher is critical because teachers guide the students and they also act as role models by participating in the process. Let's look at some advantages and disadvantages. As you can see in that block that says positive outcomes, there are many more advantages than negative outcomes. So extensive reading would, can help uh, students increase their world knowledge on subjects of choice. It does contribute to their motivation because there is no assessment. It helps them build a positive attitude towards reading. About one third of vocabulary growth for each student results due to extensive reading. This is what the literature says. It also supports the development of fluency and improved spelling as well as improved writing ability. Overall, it helps breed good readers. It's a little challenging to think of any negative outcomes from extensive, resulting from extensive reading. However, there are some practical problems. One of these is time because when time is allocated for extensive reading where students engage in reading for pleasure, this is an intrusion into the mandatory curriculum that requires completion. And then money because one has to decide whether money should be invested into books or into technology or free resources that are easily available on the internet. And the third, uh, uh, challenge is to think about how do you monitor uh, the individual student progress? What sort of activities would you use to look at students making progress in terms of vocabulary or grammar or spelling or even their writing skills? Here are some models of extensive reading that we are familiar with here in the Middle East. One of the most popular ones is the year of reading that was 2016. The government declared uh, that the year of the reading and they engaged people and students and institutions in reading oriented projects. Lots of books were collected and donated all over the world to countries where students do not have sufficient access to learning resources. A very popular um, festival is called the Emirates Airline Festival of Literature, sponsored by Emirates Airline. It's now in its 10th year, and uh, they invite authors from all over the world and get people to interact with them. Uh, there is also a lot, there are also a lot of uh, used books exhibitions around the country all supported by the government as well. Uh, their schools have reading labs 
and institutions such as where Christine Kuhn works have fabulous learning resource centers where uh, students have access to exceptional learning resources uh, which they can utilize in their own time or during allocated learning periods, independent learning periods. There are lots of reading circles around the country as well and uh, coffee shops uh, where people meet, adult readers meet and read books of choice. They meet once a month, lots of meetups. So you can see a number of initiatives where it says in the Middle East. Now, I've mentioned Pakistan here because uh, some like-minded colleagues, which includes Christine Coombe, got together, and I'm part of this as well. We launched some initiatives in uh, rural areas in Pakistan, and one of these is called the Vista Brains Book Drive, where we collected books from institutions in the UAE that were donating these uh, the books that they didn't need, and we took them to rural areas in Pakistan. We helped set up uh, resource centers. Uh, there's one in Islamabad called the Lisa Barlow Resource Center and another one in a rural town called Wazirabad. It's called the MKF Library. That's a slightly bigger resource center. So we've housed these areas with books and these are meant to help rural teachers uh, uh, develop themselves. A very recent initiative is the Teachers Reading Circle that we've set up in Wazirabad where teachers got together uh, and they explore research articles written by authorities in the field. One of the things that experts say about extensive reading is that learners should be able to read quickly, enjoyably, with adequate comprehension so that they don't need a dictionary. And to this effect, they give us eight steps. The first one talks about identifying resources and engaging them in the planning process. So the first thing to do is to think about who will be involved in setting up this extensive reading program in our institution, for example. Is it the parents, teachers, students, management, who else? The second thing is to analyze these resources. So what kind of time commitment will they contribute to this process? or to this project? What sort of resources will be easily available? Where will the funding come from? Do the students have any books at home or do we need to start buying books? And what kind of support will the institution provide when engaging in setting up a program like this? The third step is planning. So you can think big, but start small. So you can start by thinking, what will this program look like in five years time? What do I want? Do I want my students to read uh, just once a week throughout the semester? Or, you know, what is the time period? Do I want them to read just in the class or at home as well, or just outside the class? So this is something you need to put into your planning process. And uh, what is the minimal investment that can be made in terms of uh, the institutional con contribution and how will you assess the progress because it is taking, it is going to, if you do it in the classroom, it will eat into your classroom time as well. The fourth step is about setting up. So you have to be very practical and involve students in this process. Let them take charge. The fifth step talks about introducing gradually, which means when you first introduce extensive reading into your classrooms, allocate just about 20 minutes to start with and build it up from there. Let the students decide uh, what sort of books they would choose. Start with relatively easier levels. The sixth step talks about monitoring the process. At the beginning, it is recommended that you do it informally, which means observe their body language when they're reading, what, what does their body language look like? Do they look bored? Do they look happy? Do they smile? Um, I got a smiley on my screen. The seventh stage talks about evaluation. Now, when we look at uh, intensive reading, there are lots of formal ways to evaluate this. In terms of informal reading, the idea is to make evaluation or monitoring uh, interesting. So you could engage students in something like book circles or reading to younger classes or even something like Snapchat reviews, which I've used in my own classroom. And students seem to love it because the current generation of teenagers use Snapchat quite um, uh, often. So these are some ideas. 
Now, the final thing that I'd like to talk about is connecting to a platform. So one of the things we need to do when setting up things like these is to think about what work and what could be done better. And to that effect, a professional learning network is very helpful. We've got one set up uh, that I currently manage. It's called the Extensive Reading Foundation in Pakistan, but we have members from Pakistan, Turkey, Indonesia, Armenia, uh, just lots of places wherever I've been to and I've introduced these. And these are the links here. We've got a Facebook page, we've got a Twitter account and an Instagram account. You're very welcome to connect with us. All of this information in my presentation today is right there available on these pages. And I look forward to connecting with all of you as well. Thank you very much.